Good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth annual Getzen Lecture in Government Accountability. I'm Tom Loth, the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs. On behalf of the school and the Department of Public Administration and Policy, I'm pleased to welcome Admiral Thad Allen as this year's Getzen uh, Lecturer. Before introducing Admiral Allen, I want to recognize a special guest. The Getzen Lecture in Government Accountability is made possible through the generosity of University of Georgia alumni Catherine Getzen Willoughby and Mr. Dan Hall Willoughby in honor of her parents. Evangeline and Forrest Getzen are lifelong advocates of public service and education. Catherine Willoughby is unable to be with us this afternoon, but Dan is here, and Dan, I'm gonna ask you to stand and say thank you to you and Catherine for your generous support of our school and our, our students. Admiral Thad W. Allen is a senior fellow at the Rand Corporation and a distinguished professor of practice at uh, George Washington University. Allen became the 23rd Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard in May 2006 and led a massive effort to update the service's antiquated, I think that's his word, command and logistics organizations and to address future maritime challenges facing the, uh, the nation. Prior to this command, while serving as the service's chief of staff, Admiral Allen was the principal federal official overseeing the response to Hurricane Katrina and the recovery efforts in the Gulf Coast. Allen led many command posts throughout his Coast Guard career, including command of the Coast Guard's Atlantic Forces and its response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. In the months prior to his retirement from the Coast Guard, in June of 2010, he served as the National Incident Commander for the federal government's response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, one of the worst environmental disasters in U.S. history. And he continued to serve in this role as a civilian. Admiral Allen received his bachelor's degree from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, a master's in public administration from the George Washington University, and a master's degree in management from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Sloan School of Management. He's the recipient of two Homeland Security Distinguished Service Medals, the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, three Coast Guard Distinguished Service Medals, a Legion of Merit Medal, and three Meritorious Service Medals. He's an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. He's a native of Tucson, Arizona, and the son of a Coast Guard petty officer. However, he told me last evening that following his father's career was not the main reason he entered the Coast Guard. He wanted to try his hand at college football and the U.S. Coast Guard Academy offered him a scholarship to play middle linebacker for the Coast Guard Academy Bears. Thad is married with two daughters and one son. Please join me in welcoming to the University of Georgia Admiral Thad Allen. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate that. And as I promised, I didn't headbutt you. Ted Bunny. Uh, it's great to be here at the University of Georgia. I've never been to Athens before. What a lovely uh, setting uh, for a great institution. And I'm treasuring the opportunity to be here uh, for the Willoughby family. Thank you so much for honoring Catherine's parents and allowing me to be part of that legacy. Uh, I'm well aware and mindful of the folks who have spoken here before me and the uh, uh, terrific company which I'm uh, joining here today. And the opportunity to do that is something that I will treasure for a long time. So we, we thank you again. I appreciate it very much. 
The uh, topic for this speech annually has been accountability, and it comes in a lot of forms. I know one of your previous speakers was David Walker, who's a very good friend of mine, and he actually changed the name of the Government Accounting Office to the Government Accountability Office uh, because he thought that uh, the function of government should be something more than just uh, bureaucratic processes, uh, audits, and report development. He thought there ought to be a link between the performance of government officials and the citizens they serve. Uh, my best contribution to the concept of accountability, which is a great concept and one we should always keep in the forefront of our minds when we're looking at performance of government, uh, will be to, today to talk a little bit about accountability in the form of what we need to do during major events. Obviously, I've been involved in two uh, large crises, the recent history of this country, Hurricane Katrina and the Deepwater oil spill. Uh, but I think the notion of accountability uh, during these events extends well beyond that to what we do in our daily activities and running government organizations and meeting our commitment to the American people. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about accountability in the context of responding to these crises. But I think we need to understand that the better off we are in running our organizations competently on a day-to-day -day basis, the better we will be in a crisis. Because the basics of running large, complex organizations and dealing with large problems uh, set, the, set the basis for our ability to perform in a crisis, which only adds, in my view, time compression, uh, media visibility, political pressure, and the requirement to make uh, decisions under conditions of uncertainty with incomplete information. But as I told the uh, faculty and the students that I talked to earlier today, uh, the more resilient we can make our organizations uh, in responding uh, to crises, uh, we will do that in the fact that we get better every day at operating them and serving the American public. So what I'd like to talk about today is the hurricane response in Katrina. I'd like to talk a little bit about Haiti. And I'd like to talk about the oil spill response in the context of accountability, improving performance, trying to understand what it is we need to do to achieve unity of effort, which is always the overall goal to create a whole of nation, whole community response that the public expects us to do in these situations. And then I would be happy to engage in a dialogue with you. Uh, I find that uh, when we talk about these topics, uh, I like to talk about them because I've lived them. Uh, but I'm always much richer for the chance to have a conversation here, different points of view, uh, and answer questions you may have for me. If I could, I'd like to take you back to uh, August 29, 2005. Uh, that is the day that Hurricane Katrina came ashore. In the week that followed the landfall of the hurricane, a lot of disturbing events took place uh, that made the public and the citizens of the Gulf Coast question whether or not there was a competent response being formed. Uh, to meet the extraordinary dev devastation of the hurricane. Uh, we had the really disturbing events in the, uh, in the Superdome, followed by overcrowding and similar events that occurred in the Convention Center in New Orleans. On the 5th of September, uh, Labor Day 2005, uh, I was called by Secretary Chertoff at about 11 in the morning and was asked if I would go to New Orleans and take over the response in and around New Orleans given the events that occurred there as the deputy principal federal official to Mike Brown, who was in charge of the overall response, who was located in Baton Rouge. I got an airplane, I flew immediately to Baton Rouge. <clears throat> I met with emergency uh, officials in the state of Louisiana. The next morning I met with, uh, with Mike Brown and I uh, flew into New Orleans on the morning of the 6th of September. Uh, it was a sobering and a shocking sight. Uh, the, the city remained full of water. The water was black. It was very quiet and eerie. Uh, there were no birds or animal life to be heard. There were still buzzing of helicopters because search and rescue was still going on. Uh, there were helicopters moving to put bags in to try and repair the uh, breaches in the flood walls that had caused the flooding in New Orleans. As I landed at the landing zone down by the waterfront, I realized that we as a government, in trying to assess what had happened on the 29th and the 30th of August, hadn't got the problem correct and I think therefore did not know exactly what to do in those first five to six days. And I want to explain it to you because it has everything to do with government accountability and how we think about these incidents and potentially how we need to create leaders in the future to be able to understand how you analyze information that's coming in and then act in the best interest of the American people. We had responded from the 29th of August on as if this were a regular hurricane. And it was a hurricane. It was a devastating hurricane. But if it was only a hurricane, if New Orleans is not flooded, 
if we don't have a breach of the flood walls and the levee above the lower ninth ward, ground zero of this event would have been Waveland and Bay, St. Louis, Mississippi. 25 feet of water went over and swept those towns away. When we had the flooding in New Orleans, this became a different event, and I believe that our failure to adequately understand that and react to it uh, was one of the causes that didn't allow us to act as we should have. And if you don't allow for these things to evolve and understand them, then there's always going to be a question of confidence by the American public whether or not you're doing the right thing, and that is the essence. That is the essence of accountability. I believe that what happened in New Orleans when the city was flooded was the equivalent of having a weapon of mass effect used on the city without criminality. Now that was a long statement. I'm going to take it apart for you and, and tell you what it means and why it came to that conclusion and how it drove my behavior. And I think where it got us to a point that we could respond to the city and the state officials and do what we needed to as a federal government. If you take hypothetically that the levees and the flood walls would have been blown by a terrorist and we were responding to that, the special agent in charge of the FBI office in New Orleans would have been all over it. We would have been there to support the mayor and the governor uh, in the response, but there would have been federal preemption based on the crime that occurred and overall control of what happened in the city would have been controlled by the federal government. That did not happen. We had a standing governor and we had a standing mayor, but we had been flowing resources into New Orleans for six or seven days. Uh, FEMA urban search and rescue teams, Coast Guard personnel saved 33,000 people in seven days off rooftops and with small boats. Uh, the National Distress Medical System teams that were sent in. These teams were all there. They were working very, very hard. The problem is uh, they were self-deployed. They did not report to anybody because the city had lost continuity of government. But their leadership was intact. And under the law in this country, all power is not granted to the federal government or reserved to the states. That's the 14th Amendment, folks. And what that means is state and local governments are responsible for emergency response. There was a standing mayor, standing governor, and they had the legal authority to conduct a response. We could not supplant that. There was not a legal cause to do that. There was discussion throughout the week in Washington on whether or not we should invoke the Insurrection Act, but you usually do that when you've lost leadership in a community. That had not happened. When I understood that we were dealing with the equivalent of a weapon of mass effect used on the city of New Orleans without criminality and they had lost continuity of government, the command and control structure to be able to take the resources and apply them to mission effect, then we could proceed and decide how to put together a response that would support them. And what I did was I sat down with General Russ Honore, some of you may remember that very colorful army guy that was down there with me, and the first thing we agreed to was not to fight, <laughs> to be teammates. Uh, to focus what we could on the people of the Gulf Coast, particularly in Louisiana. Uh, we divided the city of New Orleans up in the surrounding areas into sectors, and we assigned each sector to one of Russ Honore's forces. The 82nd Airborne got the Central Business District, uh, the Marine Corps was in the Lower Ninth Ward in St. Bernard Parish, and so forth. And then we took those components and we created teams of 25 to 30 people with high water vehicles, rubber boats, and we provided access, logistics, and security to allow New Orleans and local officials and state police to go door to door and check every house, look for survivors, and make a decision on whether to enter that house. And as we did that, as you remember, uh, they spray painted symbols on the houses to indicate where they had been and what the results of the uh, search had been. In constituting the response that way, we were able to take the resources that were sent there, organize them, provide them in support of the city without undercutting the illegal authority of the mayor or the governor. I think had we understood that on the 29th, we would have acted differently. Which gets to my original point. You have to question all the assumptions when one of these things occur, and you have to ask very frank questions of whether or not we really understand the problem. And I'm not sure we understood the problem. Otherwise, we would have had incident management support down there on Tuesday or Wednesday. We would have been able to react quicker with greater agility to the events that were unfolding in the, uh, in the Superdome and the Convention Center. Later that week, on Friday, I was called to Baton Rouge. Secretary Chertoff called me in uh, to his office, and he said, uh, let me tell you what's going to happen next. We're going to have a press conference in 30 minutes, and you're going to leave Mike Brown of the entire response for the entire Gulf. If you want to know how I found out about it, that's how I found out about it. <laughs> uh, we had a very, very uncomfortable press conference. 
Uh, Mike Brown left, and I was responsible for the, the, the response for the entire Gulf Coast, all five states. My aide at that point said, what do you want to do? <laughs> and I said, well, I've got a new command, I guess, here. Uh, I want to have an all-hands meeting. And she was rather surprised because we were in a big Dillard's warehouse on Florida Avenue in Baton Rouge. It's a Dillard's warehouse and a Dillard's store that had been closed. We had about 5,000 people in this uh, complex. I said, get as many people as you can in the largest open space. I want to talk to everybody. And they had managed to get about 2,500 people in the bottom floor, what used to be the Dillard's store. I got up on a, a desk with a loud hailer. And I told everybody that I would be going back to New Orleans to make sure we had continuity because we couldn't stop what we were doing down there that we had made successful in the last week. Uh, that I would be back in a couple of days. Uh, but I looked out over everybody and I said, listen, I'm going to give you all an order right now. You to treat everybody you've come in contact with that's been affected by this storm as if they were a member of your own family. Your mother, your father, your grandmother, your brother, your sister. And I'm telling you that for two reasons. Number one, if you make a mistake, you're going to err on the side of doing too much. And that's all right. I'd rather you do that. And number two, if anybody's got a problem with what you did, their problem's not with you, their problem's with me, because I told you. There was a sense of relief in the room that it's hard for me to describe to you right now. Uh, there were some people openly weeping. There was a collective sigh that actually reduced the barometric pressure in the room, at least metaphorically. <coughs> Nobody had told these people what was important. Nobody explained to them the priorities. <coughs> Nobody told them that their efforts made a difference. And more importantly, nobody told them that if they carried out the directions that was provided, that somebody was watching their back and their six, if you will. The importance of establishing up front the overarching goals, the mission to be achieved, the objectives, empowering your people, and then telling them that if they do the best they can, you will stand behind them in my view, is the essence of accountability for the federal government on behalf of the citizens. Because what the people of this country expect is a human face of the response, somebody that can articulate what the government is doing, but somebody that is accountable and responsible for the response itself. And I think in many ways for the first week of the response in Hurricane Katrina, it really wasn't clear. Mike Brown had gone forward, but he was in Baton Rouge. Most of the official statements were coming out of Washington. And the reports coming out of New Orleans from reporters standing on the street belied some of the official statements were, that were being made in Washington. You can't have that kind of gap. You can't have that kind of lack of clarity on what the government's going to do and instill confidence in the American people that you're doing the right thing. So again, the essence in this case of accountability was getting the problem right focusing the resources in the right structure to be able to achieve the means you want, respecting the legal authorities of the local mayor and, the, and then bringing the huge resources of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, and all the other resources to bear on solving the problem. I'd like to move forward just for a second to Haiti. 12 January, a year ago, Right, at, right around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, extraordinarily destructive earthquake struck Port-au-Prince. You might wonder why I'm up, I'm up here talking about the earthquake. Well, we have Coast Guard cutters that patrol off Haiti and the coast of Cuba continually uh, related to illegal migration. We've had mass migrations from both countries in the past. Uh, we have a tremendous Haitian population in South Florida, uh, and it's something we always watch. Because we had Coast Guard cutters nearby, uh, Coast Guard men and women were the first on scene the next morning in Port-au-Prince. Uh, what they saw horrified them. They went ashore and tried to uh, provide first aid, but a couple of Coast Guard cutters with a few hundred people were not going to be adequate to the task. Uh, we had people that were electri electricians and machinery technicians who were actually splinting fractures with tree limbs. And what was, what was referred to by one of the people down there was Civil War medicine was being carried out because that's all we could do until we got more help on scene. Uh, there was a meeting in the White House later that day with the President. I went there with Secretary Napolitano and Craig Fugate, the director of FEMA. And the President made it unequivocally clear what he wanted done in Haiti. Hemispheric partner, neighbor of ours, 
large Haitian population in southern Florida, issues related to migration, potential issues for a temporary protective status for Haitians living in this country. There was every reason in the world for us to be concerned about what was going on in Haiti and to mount an effective response down there. Understanding that the long-term recovery of Haiti and the long-term issues related to Haitian, the Haitian nation rests largely with the UN mission that was down there at the time and will continue to be worked through the UN mission uh, going forward. Uh, the cabinet officers walked out of the meeting that day and as I told everybody else, they were, they were uh, well inspired by the president. In fact, I called them all the Blues Brothers. At that point, they were all on a mission from God, if you remember the movie. Uh, Secretary Napolitano was a, uh, especially uh, concerned about what we could do in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so I sat down with her and I sat down with Craig Fugate and I, and I proposed that the best use of the resources inside the Department of Homeland Security would be to create a team and send it to Haiti that was the same structure that we used to get once we got things right in New Orleans. And that was a combined team of uh, FEMA and Coast Guard with a Coast Guard Admiral, a FEMA executive, uh, deployed with uh, command and control equipment, vans where we could set up and create uh, the capability the ambassador would need to support the, uh, the government of Haiti. Load that stuff on a C-17, fly it down to Port-au-Prince, and set it up on the embassy grounds. Uh, that is what we did. And we empowered the ambassador and USAID to support the government of Haiti. Uh, I would make this comparison to Haiti and New Orleans, although Haiti was an order of magnitude or several order of magnitudes worse in terms of loss of life and the destruction. The problem we had in Haiti was the same one in New Orleans in that uh, we had leadership still there, but they had lost continuity of government. The difference was we were dealing with a sovereign nation as opposed to a mayor and a governor within the United States uh, federal system. As a result of that, we were able to mobilize what I thought was a very effective response. The thing we couldn't do was get supplies into Haiti and do it fast. They would lost the seaport. They had one runway that was suitable for day landings. Uh, and the only other way into Port-au-Prince was a 12-hour ride by truck over the top of the hills from uh, the Dominican Republic. At a cabinet meeting at the White House, it was decided that Secretary Clinton would go to Haiti and meet with President Preval and ask that if we could take the airspace and manage the landing slots at the airport. Uh, this is something that uh, the Haitian government was not sure about to begin with. This is basically giving up sovereignty over your airspace, and they were concerned that we would equitably manage the landing slots in case another country was coming in with relief supplies. It would not be an entire U.S. show. In the first 24 hours following uh, the earthquake, there were 13 landings at the airport in Port-au-Prince. At the height of the airlift, once we took control of the airspace, we had 160 landings in one day. And the Air Force did that all out of Tyndall Air Force Base in the Panhandle of Florida. They managed the slots coming in, and we significantly improved the impact. Uh, one of the other things we did that I thought was particularly effective, we used the current uh, non-governmental organizations around the ground in Haiti uh, to be the distribution point for relief supplies. Rather than try and reinvent that, they had uh, existing relationships with the folks in the community, and our goal was to get the uh, supplies out there. The real challenge was slotting the landing slots so you got the right material and equipment in in the right sequence. If you send 10 loads of water in, you've got 10 loads of water on the runway. What you need is some water, some trucks, some people, some debris removal equipment so you can stage in what you need, move it into the city, and keep that flow going. And that all, all had to be related on where it was being loaded out of the United States and how it was being flown down. To accomplish that purpose, Craig Fugate went over to USIED and sat down with their director, Ajeev Shah. We put together a cell that prioritized the landing slots, including the forum folks that wanted to participate, and we provided that to the Department of Defense. And they worked, they worked it through the Air Force as far as managing the airspace. But I think it's important to understand that we learned from New Orleans, we're able to take that construct for creating a mission incident management team and sending it down there uh, to support the U.S. Ambassador moving forward. Uh, if I can move forward to the oil spill real quickly here. The difference between the oil spill and the hurricane response in terms of accountability was a difference in the legal structure under which the response was carried out. In Hurricane Katrina, we were supporting a local government exercising their authority in support of them, and we did not have the legal authority to preempt the, the mayor or the governor. In an oil spill, there is clear legal basis for federal preemption. In this case, the oil well was 45 miles off the coast of Louisiana. It was outside state waters. Folks, oil on the water is agnostic to state boundaries. And if you've been up where Mississippi Sound meets the Chandelier Islands between Louisiana and Mississippi, it's really hard to tell what state you're in. 
clear case for federal preemption and coordination. In this case, my challenge was not my legal authority. The challenge was the acceptance of my legal authority by state and local governments that wanted to uh, have resources assigned to them and carry out the disaster as if it was a disaster response, not an oil spill. And the challenge I had during the oil spill was it created polit what I call polit political cognitive dissonance with the local leaders in that they didn't feel they had control over it, but there was really no way to adequately manage the resources across the five states in the Gulf region when there was not enough uh, boom or skimming equipment to protect all five states simultaneously. That required resource allocation decisions and trade-offs. Uh, and that is the reason I've said that the biggest challenge I had during the oil spill, aside from the technical aspects of dealing with the well itself, was managing the expectations of local political leaders and even the senior political leaders in Washington uh, regarding the fact that the federal government was responsible for coordinating this with BP carrying out its role as a responsible party under the law to bringing contractors to the scene uh, to clean up the oil. The complicating factor was, and this is something you have to deal with when these uh, issues come up, is that at least in the minds of senior leaders, it didn't appear to be a relevant role for the federal government in capping the well. All the technology related to stopping that oil and capping the well were held in the private sector. And to be successful at this, we had BP and their industry partners had to work together, and it was going to be an industry solution, not a federal government solution. However, we had, over, we had oversight responsibilities to make sure they effectively carried out their task. To make sure there was a role for the federal government and we were accommodating that, uh, we set up a science team headed by Secretary Chu, who was the Secretary of Energy, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics. And they, they co-located with the BP engineers in Houston, and all the plans and proposals for capping the well and containing the well and so forth uh, were, were looked at by the science team, and they advised me as a National Incident Commander prior to any direction I might give BP moving forward. Uh, I will tell you this. It is difficult to manage an operational response and a political response in the same battle space, folks. And there's a constant tension between the need for political leaders to act and demonstrate they're being responsive to constituents and still accommodate what I would call the existing doctrine or standard operating procedures so you can do what you need to do. And because of that, at the federal, state, and local level, we had many political leaders that felt the need to act and take independent actions. And one of the things that was most challenging for me to do as a national incident commander, and this begins, uh, becomes another matter of accountability, is to stay focused on what it is you're trying to do. In this case, it was contain the oil, cap the well, drill a relief well, kill the well, take care of as much oil offshore as we could before it came ashore, and then deal with the oil as it came ashore in the best possible way possible, and not harm the environment in the process of doing that by the spill response itself. That entire process, that entire process is what I focused on. And my role as a National Incident Commander was try and deal with the media issues, the political issues, the congressional oversight, and the local political leaders at the state and local government to free my people up to focus on what they needed to do, which was solve the problem. It's very hard in these situations to kind of separate out what you need to do operationally from the immense pressure that's being brought to bear by what folks need to need, think need to be done and the urge of political leaders to act. In the long run, the most consequential day of this response probably was around the middle of June. I flew to Pensacola with the President. We were on our way back on Air Force One. He was going to address the uh, nation that night from the Oval Office. And he came and sat down next to me on Air Force One, and he looked at me straight in the eye, and he says, Thad, do you have enough resources? And I said, sir, I've got enough resources. In terms of BP and the U.S. government, there's enough money out there. I've got a supply base problem that we can't produce enough boom and skimming equipment in this country or bring enough in from foreign suppliers to simultaneously protect five states. But we'll work through that. It is not a money issue, it's a, it's, it's a production supply chain issue. And then I said to the President, I said, you know, I think I didn't learn enough from the Haitian response. There's one thing I need to do. And he said, what's that? And I said, I need to take control of the airspace. We had had eight near mid air collisions up to that point in the response with a number of helicopters that were out there involved in uh, skimming operations and situ burning, uh, dispersants. Uh, Coast Guard helicopters flying out there. We had NASA and NOAA airplanes flying, taking uh, readings of the oil on the water. Uh, we had media out there, and we had National Guard flying from the states. 
It was a very, very complicated airspace. Over the well itself, at one point, we had 35 vessels operating within one mile and 20 ROVs. Uh, the fact that we did not have a major marine casualty or an air event while we were there, I thought was absolutely extraordinary. But I thought in order to take, in order to take advantage of the number of vessels of opportunity that have been brought on board, and these are those vessels that BP hired to take part in the spill, we needed some way to organize them and give them sighting and reconnaissance information to put them right on top of the whale so they could be more effective. Uh, I've told people in the past uh, those vessels of opportunity were like being presented with the militia that we found at Concord before our revolution. You know, the folks showed up uh, with uh, passion, resources, and commitment, but some of them had a musket and some only had a knife. And we had to form them up somehow, get them to march, and then go ahead and beat the British. Well, I had a floating militia out there uh, that needed to be organized during the response itself. And so the decision to take control of the airspace was allow, would allow us to consolidate all of the reconnaissance information that was going on, bring it back to one place, in this case, Tyndall Air Force Base, and be able to effectively deploy those vessels where we needed them most. Had I had it to do over again, I would have closed the airspace and taken control of it on the first day. Uh, we did it in Haiti. We knew it was successful. I should have done it on the first day. Also, probably should have been more careful about how we brought those vessels of opportunity on. Not all of them were capable of doing things we wanted them to do, and there's an issue of training these folks to be around hazardous materials and then the overall impact of operating those boats in oil for an extended period of time. Those are things that if these things only happen once in a lifetime, you don't learn them, and they present themselves. But you have to be accountable, and you have to respond to what happens. At one point, we had a problem with volatile organic compounds. Those were the fumes that were coming off of the oil. And the exposure standards that were established by the uh, Office of, of uh, Safety and Occupational Health, OSHA, and the Department of Labor indicated at this level of exposure you needed a certain amount of, of personal protective equipment, but they readily admitted that the regs were, 20 year, were 10 years out of date, maybe 20. So I summarily ordered a lower the exposure standard and a raising of the personal protective equipment based on an agreement I made with uh, OSHA during the response itself. Those are the things you have to do to manage the event while it's going on. In this case, being accountable to the responders and making sure their safety moving forward. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of general comments about these responses as they relate to accountability in government and where I think we're going. And I'd be glad to engage in some questions at that point. I think in general, we're moving into an area that's very confused in our government right now and in our country regarding how we respond to large, complex problems, whether they're crises or not. Uh, you know, the hurricane was a crisis, the oil spill was a crisis. The debt's a crisis. What happened with our automakers was a crisis. The financial uh, performance of the, uh, of the enterprises over the last five or six years has been a crisis. And I believe that there is a growing disconnect between the American public about what they expect government can do and what government can really do. And let me explain that to you just a little bit. Uh, we live in a world today where it's very easy to do things in our personal lives. How many of you do most of your shopping on the internet for Christmas. I know, you know, we both work in my house. Uh, you know, you order a book from Amazon, and a day later you get an email that says, you like this book, here are four others. And somebody actually has your pattern of life out there and is watching you for what you may want that they can sell you. And in some cases we like that because it, it gives us excellent service and, uh, and, and we can get the maximum amount of benefit from dealing with these folks that are selling us stuff. On the other hand, we're wary about giving too much information away. Well, when something happens and we have a large complex problem in government and we're looking to hold them accountable, we want them to be as efficient as we see the private sector. We want that kind of performance out of them, but we're even more loath to give them any information about us to allow the, the government to create a pattern of life that somehow they knew. And I think it's a tension we're going to have to deal with moving forward because the more we get efficient in living the rest of our lives, there's a de facto expectation created that somehow government is going to get more efficient too. And the fact of the matter is, within the, the, the existing authorities, jurisdictions, and appropriations of any agency, no agency can solve a complex problem anymore in government by itself, which puts a premium on collaboration, networks, and partnerships to be effective and be accountable to the American people for what they expect you need to be able to do, especially when there's a crisis and you've got to get it right then because it really, really matters. So what, what does this mean for government going forward? Well, I believe in, in terms of crisis management, there is never going to be a major event in this country again that won't involve public participation. They're going to participate. You know why? Because they can. 
There is no barrier to entry for non-governmental organizations, volunteer organizations to say, I'm here, I've got passions, resources, and commitment, like those uh, militia and those uh, vessels of opportunity. The question is, how are we going to deal with them? Because if we don't, they will immediately go to the press, or they'll have the alternative of social media, and they will elect to produce social behaviors in ways that will impact the response anyway. And I think the challenge going forward, and the challenge I've taken up at RAND, is to work with the private sector, work with non-governmental organizations, and how we actually bring them into the response earlier, take advantage of the passion, resources, and commitment that they have, and basically get them into the fight moving forward. And in the process of doing that, I think we need to understand that the sociological environment that we operate in has changed as well. And by that, I mean changes in the news cycle. I mean, we have seven by 24 hour news channels, folks. And if there's no news that day, they don't go off air. <laughs> so you have this really interesting thing happens where they fill the, they fill the time up with reporters interviewing reporters. <laughs> or this new breed of folks they call commentators. By the way, I was asked to be one of those and I, I declined that. I was gonna do something else for the rest of my life. Um, so they're out there. You can't change it. It's a feature of the environment. It's like the weather. It has to be taken into account and you may not be able to change it. Uh, the same applies to social media. We had a mid-level executive from Google materially impact what happened on the streets of Cairo. It ultimately resulted in a change of government. We had Japanese folks in this country finding out the only way they could get the status on their loved ones and, get a, and, and find out what had happened to people they cared about in Japan was through Facebook. We had news being reported through tweets that is faster than the news cycle. In fact, I had an interesting conversation the other day uh, with Ed Henry, the, white, the CNN uh, uh, White House uh, correspondent about the prevalence of tweeting while things are actually going on where you, before you can get out of the event, there's actually news being generated. Uh, somehow we have to figure out how to deal with that. John Holdren, who is a science and technology advisor to the president, gives a great talk on climate change and why we need to think about it and why it's important, why we need to deal with it. And he says there are three ways to deal with climate change. You can suffer, you can adapt, or you can manage. I would submit to you that the changes in the 7 by 24 hour news cycle, changes in social media, high performance computing, our ability to do data searches and, and, and do pattern recognition on how we live and work has fundamentally changed our sociological environment. These are the equivalent of sociological changes in our ecology. And I believe that John Holdren is right. We have three ways we can deal with it. We can suffer we can adapt or we can manage. For that reason, during the oil spill, for the first time, I think, in the history of this country for a major disaster response, we actually took everything we knew, put it on a global information GIS system, and put it on a website and made it available to the public. For the same reason, we, we took the video of the oil coming out of that well, as painful as it was, and made it public, including the steps that were taken to actually put the cap on the well uh, when we were done. Uh, the senior leaders of BP came to me and said, you know, I'm not sure we want to put pressure on the ROV operators to be subjected to that kind of scrutiny while they're trying to put this thing in place 5,000 feet uh, below the uh, ocean surface uh, with hundreds of millions of people watching. And my response was, we don't have any choice. The amount of uh, credibility loss we would suffer and the lack of transparency and the interpretation of whether or not we were being held accountable during this response, I said, we can't do it. We're gonna have to go live. And, and they did it, and they did it successfully moving forward. Transparency is what we should strive for. If we can't be transparent because of safety or security reasons, we should always be honest in what we tell the American public. And coming full circle back to what I said when I, uh, I originally got to uh, New Orleans to my people regarding how you treat people who have been involved in these uh, situations, the public wants a face of the response. They want somebody that's accountable and responsible. They want government to be postured proactively on their to their benefit, and our failure to do that in any respect 
slow to respond, not dealing with the social media, not dealing with the print media, the television media, will result in somebody else filling that space, loss of confidence, and uh, realization in the minds of the American people that number one, we're not doing our job, but number two, we're not being as accountable as we should be. So I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you for allowing me to kind of share some thoughts on this. I teach a course at George Washington University on leadership in large complex organizations. I can tell you this is what we talk about every day. I talk to the faculty here at the University of Georgia today. These are things that are happening currently in the environment where the public administration and public policy graduates are leaving school and finding jobs in. I think it's something we all have to think about, adapt to, and have conversations about how we teach, how we learn, and how we prepare the students for uh, lives in public service. But to that end, everything that I saw here today in my conversations with the students this morning, the faculty, and your presence here today tells me that the University of Georgia cares. Dean, you care, the school cares, the Willoughby's care, and it's an honor to be here under these circumstances and have this conversation because it's far too important in this country not to have the conversation. So I'm glad to be here and I'd be glad to take any questions you may have for me. Thank you.